very much. Um, uh, and thank you, all of you, Sebastian and Alex and the Danish team. And it's funny, it's, it's like I feel it's the home, home field advantage. You know, I've, I've been giving more talks here than any other place in the world. And I'm looking forward uh, and also noticing how we're really doing this revolution. Look, we're about, we have to spend time on our health and not spend time on treating disease, right? That's the revolution that we are leading. And I wanna present now a potential shortcut that came under the radar just recently and is developing really quickly. And I'll phrase it by, you're in a longevity clinic or you're a primary practitioner or, or, or an internist and somebody comes and said, I heard you can do something about aging. What can I do about aging? And we all are giving those advices, right? And we're all trying to optimize, where is Michael Ringel? Optimizing uh, what we're doing with exercise, with diet, sleep, and social connectivity. So I'm leaving that, okay? But, you know, but then we're still aging and not everybody can do everything and not everybody can optimize everything. And so usually when people come to you and say, what else can we do? Most of the people... And most of the patients are expecting supplements. And I want to say in one word, this is crazy. I'll show you the alternative, but this is crazy. Um, we know nothing about supplements. In particular, we don't know anything about using supplements, uh, multi-supplements. I want to point out to a, a, a paper in JAMA, one of the JAMA journals last week, that followed 7 million people over 12 years and showed that those that had multi-supplements had 4% increase in mortality. Okay, it shocked me because usually the people who take multivitamins are also doing all those things, okay? Still they had higher mortality. So I wanna offer something other than supplement. I wanna uh, uh, suggest an FDA approved drugs. Okay, now there's no FDA approved drugs for gerotherapeutics, okay? So listen to me. Um, what is the advantage of considering FDA-approved drugs? First of all, our treatment of longevity will move to doctors, okay? David Sinclair is not going to sell those drugs, okay? Only supplements, okay? So we, we want doctors to be responsible, and as, uh, just to double on what Jim said, we don't want to kill anybody on, on the road to success. But obviously, FDA-approved uh, drugs have safety, efficacy, and also are being used for years. So how do we judge which FDA-approved drugs can improve, uh, can become gerotherapeutics? Well, on the preclinical side, all the drugs that I'll show you and all the drugs that you heard about are changing hallmarks of aging. The hallmarks of aging are great because it's really reflecting that you're taking an old cell, an old organ, an old body, make it younger, and so you're changing lots of things. So we've shown in almost every drug that hallmarks of aging are changing, and that's why we're geroscientists. <coughs> also, in preclinical pre -clinical data, we have the data that our animals are healthy and our animals are, are living longer. I think this is from one of uh, Rafa Cavo, uh, Rafa's uh, papers, uh, uh, or, or it meant to be, on caloric restriction. Okay, but this is the important point. What do we need to show clinically? Well, clinically, we have to show that the drug, remember, FDA-approved drug for something else, okay, that it somehow prevents other disease. In other words, on a five-year study, okay, at the end, not only you treated whatever disease, but something else happened and you're healthy. That's one thing. And the second thing that you hope, that in those five-year study, you'll also show decrease in mortality. And, and by the way, when people are saying, you know, if I take the drug, will I live to be 100 years? How would you prove it? No. All we can show in a clinical study if there is a change in mortality, and by the way, I'm talking about overall mortality, right? Not disease-specific mortality. And, and maybe I should emphasize that because, you know, statins are very important drugs. Statins lower cholesterol, okay? By lowering cholesterol, they prevent cardiovascular disease. They prevent cardiovascular mortality. They're not changing hallmarks of aging. They're not changing lifespan when you give them to animals, except 
maybe nematodes, but um, in GEMS lab. But, but the point is that statins are not changing overall mortality. Statin increased the rates of diabetes by 30%. There's more suicide in Scandinavian country. It doesn't change overall mortality. We're looking for drugs that change overall mortality. So how do we go about it? Well, what we've done, and when I say we, uh, my partner is George Kushel, but we're leading a bigger group. Some, some of the people are here in on the audience. Some are going to be in the audience. And basically, we devised a system where we're going to search FDA-approved drugs that in at least one study increase lifespan. That, that's how you get to, to, to this table. And this table is about taking any one of the gerotherapeutic drug and shows on the first half, does it change hallmarks of aging? Does it increase health span in animals? Does it um, increase uh, lifespan? Six points. And then six points for humans. One is, okay, you gave it to one disease. Did it prevent one or several other diseases? Second, did it change overall mortality, not the disease-specific mortality? And we came up with those drugs, and I'm skipping it to show an update that we published recently, because there has been change. And in pink, there are four drugs that I'm going to show you examples of each that have received out of score of 12, they received anywhere above 10 scores with actually full clinical study, even if we don't know about animals, full clinical studies that they, they decrease other diseases and they decrease mortalities. I want to say one thing about rap, uh, rap, uh, rapamycin and rapalogs. Uh, there's no good, the quality of the study is something that we're considering. The, the quality of the studies on, on rapamycin are not great. There's no clinical study, huge clinical study, except jo, uh, uh, John Manick one that didn't succeed in phase three trial. Um, so I'm not inc including rapamycin. I think there's a lot of other issues that, that hasn't been resolved. I'm going to talk about those four studies. The second thing that I want to make a point, a lot of those drugs, when they were studied, have been shown to affect immunity also, okay? Again, with the hallmarks, we don't expect only that some of those drugs are for diabetes, that they'll just change glucose level. They change other hallmarks. And, and you see that four of them have actually in clinical studies showed that people with COVID are, have less hospitalization death and long COVID, particular metformin. Actually, metformin is prescribed in New York more for COVID than for any other, uh, any other reason. Okay. I'll d give you just uh, one example of SGLT2 side by side. SGLT2 in the ITP, right, in mice, where it was shown to increase lifespan in male. That's the right comma, column in many centers. Um, with the point that in humans, it doesn't have, seem to be su such a sex, uh, sex difference, okay? I'll, I'll talk about it later. But anyhow, in human studies, the results are Oops, sorry, are, are really impressive because in this one study, I won't touch it, in when, this one study, the decrease in, in the, the outcomes that I'll show you uh, again are 40%. The decrease in, uh, in renal-specific outcomes are, are 44%. The effects on, on uh, death is uh, 30% and death of any cause is 20%. Okay, look, those are studies with more than 4,000 people over, um, how much is it, 32 months, okay? 4,000 over 32 months. Not everybody took the medication. This is intention to treat. And the effects are substantial. Let me show you one example on health span of each one, just one. SGLT2 reduces cardiovascular and renal disease. That's another one, not the one that I showed you, another SGLT2 by 
Metformin decreased coronary syndrome by 48%. Biphosphonates that Jim mentioned, the one that is injectable, decreased cardiovascular disease by 33%. GLP-1 inhibitors decreased renal outcome by 22%. All those drugs were, were, were used for different reasons. And by the way, there are more SGLT2 that is prescribed to non-diabetic than diabetic. I think it's almost close to metformin. Those are the diabetes has nothing, it has to do something, but that's not about the diabetes. Okay, about mortality outcomes. SGLT2 decreased any cause of mortality by 32%. Metformin decreased diabetes mortality by 50%. There's actually a better study that's 38%. Biphosphonates decrease ICU mortality by 50%. You know, you, you're on biphosphonate, you go to ICU, you don't die. GLP-1 decreased mortality by, by 50%. Okay? Again, those are net data of exceptionally good quality uh, uh, large studies. So all those studies, you can change the story around. Those are, those are uh, mechanisms of aging that have been drugged for another reason, and they show everything I want to show about aging. It decreased the rates of diseases and mortality in a short period of time. I, I want to make a point that if you take FDA drug, any doctor can repurpose it. Okay? This is legal. Okay? This is legal. Um, metformin was first repurposed for obesity. You lose five to 10 pounds, not the best drug for obesity. It's the first drug of choice for PCOS, not FDA indicated, but that's what people are giving for PCOS. Pre-diabetes, there's a clinical study, DPP, prevented diabetes by 30%, not FDA approved, but used to prevent diabetes. And COVID, right? Decreased hospitalization, death, and long COVID by 50%. So it's already repurposed. Is it hard to think of repurposing it uh, for aging? Well, but in order to do that, okay, and I want to point another important thing that Jim said. We're talking, we have to work on secondary prevention. First of all, young people, the, the thing that angers me most is young people taking metformin. It's crazy. This is a drug that's good when you're old, not when you're young. It lowers your IGF. It's not good when you're young. It lowers testosterone in men. You don't, you don't use metformin, okay? But also, we are talking about secondary prevention, or we're trying to talk about secondary prevention, or at least say that you have to be over the age of 65 in order, and fail maybe other things in order to get it. And so we are preparing a list of conditions that will help us decide which of those drugs to give more. In other words, you, you have a patient, a man or a woman, over 65, and, the, and you want to decide which drug is best to them. We're trying to fill up this crossword uh, puzzle. And you can take as many pictures as you want. This is in process, okay? Not all of it. This is not all of it. It's kind of where we are now. But we haven't done everything, and actually we're going to do it in a committee <laughs> that's going to really uh, make and understand those recommendations. But, you know, if, sorry, if you're obese, okay, up there, does this show anything? Right, if you're obese, then GLP-1 is the best. Actually, from my perspective, start GLP-1 to treat obesity, and then you can move to the others. Uh, Pre-diabetes, we don't know about that yet. I think it will be. Uh, if you have renal disease, then SGLT2, the best. Metformin somewhat. We don't know about the others. Cardiovascular disease will be prevented by any one of those drugs with very good uh, and significant data. If it's bone loss, probably a tidronate. Frailty, uh, may maybe uh, metformin. Flu COVID prevention, you know, maybe there are more cognition, you know, GLP-1, one of the last, the, the last things was in Parkinsonism, including cognitive uh, function. Uh, NASH just coming out, PCOS I spoke about. There'll be, there'll be more, uh, more on the Y-X 
And uh, there will be update with really uh, the strength of evidence in the other. But all of it is really designed for you in Longevity Clinic to start thinking. You can do it. Those are really effective drugs. You know them much more than you know anything about supplement. What, uh, what we're doing is we're doing this consensus, you know, George and me with people from the... Uh, Longe from the academy, from the medicine society, from the longevity uh, biotech. We are planning to publish in a medical journal so that clinicians have an access to that. Um, we'll try to ag adopt a guideline. We tr we'll try to implement starting in longevity clinic. We'll do the marketing. We'll do validation. And, and maybe we can discuss with the FDA also on based on our discussion with TAME of how we repurpose those drugs to be really effective in aging. So I think the here is now in this sense, and I hope you'll think about it. This is only an abstract presentation. I'd like to hear your view about that, but I think that's ready for prime time. Think about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>